All right, folks, I want to welcome our guest to the show. It is Jonathan Redbird Dover, retired Navajo Ranger. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. I am glad to have you. I've wanted to have this conversation for a while. So I want to give the audience a little bit of background about how we got where we are. I was obsessed with unsolved mysteries as a child, and I do a lot of research, obviously, for the show. I read a lot of books, and I watch a lot of documentary television. So I stumbled across the reboot of Unsolved Mysteries just a couple of months ago, and I was fascinated with the episode that they did featuring you and Stan, former Navajo Rangers, and the investigations that you did. So, and I saw you on Doug Highcheck's show with he and Alex, and I have been fascinated with the law enforcement background and the paranormal investigations. So, I'm sure there are other people out there who may not be familiar with you and the Navajo Rangers. So, let's start there and talk about your law enforcement background and your time as a Navajo Ranger, and then we'll move into how you got involved in these paranormal investigations. Okay. Uh- the, the the short version of the story is that uh, they were looking for a ranger. I had no idea what a Navajo ranger was, uh, but I applied. And uh, I had one question that was asked of me during my interview. Uh, that was, uh, how would you feel if somebody came and threatened the, your life or the life of your family? And uh, so I told them, I says, I'd I'll cut the ears off at uh, 300 or 200 yards of 300 Savage. And they said, you're hired. Uh, come to find out that the two Rangers and before me uh, were, one of them was beat up rather badly and sent home. The other one was, uh, they threatened his family and uh, he, he put all his stuff in his truck and, and uh, quit and just left his truck out at, out at the uh, local chapter house. So um, I got the job. Next thing I know, they sent me a, a memo saying, uh, you'll attend the six-month uh, police academy in Window Rock. And if you don't pass the police academy, you'll be terminated. So uh, needless to say, I, I finished the police academy, six months of, of training. Um, uh, I finished as the Academic Achievement Award, the... Uh, uh, marksmanship award and the outstanding cadet award uh the other i was in line for the other two but they didn't uh they didn't want a ranger sweeping the awards for a police academy so um physical fitness award was changed to most physically improved and uh leadership award was changed to most spontaneous leader uh so Anyway, I, I finished the police academy. I went afterwards to more training. Uh, I was also the last ranger to be assigned uh, to work with the National Park Service for a period of six months to uh, at Canyon de Chez to learn uh, how to do uh, what they call interpretation, which is meet and greet with the public and converse with them and not be afraid to talk to them. Um, so after all that, I uh, ended or I started my career. Uh, since then, <clears throat> I spent four years initially with the Rangers. I went to the national or the uh, city of Winslow, Arizona Police Department, and uh, became a patrol officer uh, in the city. Uh, I did that for four years and finished as a patrol sergeant. Uh, and I was the first uh, Native American sergeant to ever be promoted to that rank. Uh, they uh, told me that I had to live within the city limits uh, of the town. And I had just had a brand new house built where I live now in Loop. So uh, between a brand new house in 1988 and uh, staying in the city renting a trailer, uh, I chose a house. And uh, so I left there and went back and got on with the Rangers again. After that, I went to the Historic Preservation Department for nine years and did archaeological law enforcement as a specialty. So uh, back to the Rangers in the year 2000, I attended the uh, Criminal Investigation Academy at Glencoe, Georgia, uh, which is where all the uh, uh, criminal investigators go. And a lot of the other agencies trained there. 
and uh, finished that course. And uh, so altogether, I've had about 4,000 hours of training. Uh, I'm a specialist in archaeological law enforcement investigations. Uh, I have my creds as a criminal investigator. Um, I am an instructor in mountain rescue and high angle technical rescue and uh, with with ropes and stuff like that. And then uh, I'm a, uh, a I was a licensed uh, EMT basic. Uh, so I was ambulance qualified and I would have uh, injured people out where I was uh, with an hour response time from the hospital. Um, and then uh, I'm a federal firearms instructor and I was an adjunct instructor at Gunsight Academy, which is in uh, Paulden, Arizona. So uh, that, that was for about three classes. So we, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of training, a um, lot of investment there. It definitely sounds like it. So let's talk a little bit about the Rangers themselves. Some people I was not familiar with what there's so many different types of law enforcement. I know in the city of Atlanta, it seemed like every six blocks, there was another jurisdiction that we were dealing with where there'd be a G GBI federal or some of the parks and rec police and then the airport police. What were the Rangers responsibilities and how far ranging was the area that you guys were covering? Okay, the <clears throat> Navajo Rangers were formed based, they were based on the National Park Service. The guy that formed them back in 1957 uh, came from the Park Service and felt that the Navajos deserved something similar. <clears throat> so they were put together and uh, they are a resource law enforcement department. So we did game and fish, forestry, um, you know, mines and minerals, water resources in the park areas where the park police and there are 23 parks on, on the Navajo uh, reservation and uh, a large number of lakes. Uh, so we're checking all that. Um, we do the search and rescue. It's it's mandated to us. And um, oh, good grief. Uh, there is just so much. Uh, if you consider it a resource, a renewable or non-renewable resource, uh, agriculture, livestock, we, we did all that. Uh, I personally broke a uh, uh, $100,000 livestock theft case uh, in the area where I worked. So lots and lots of different things. We found out that police officers that transferred in had a really difficult time um, just, just covering the basis. Uh, the Navajo Rangers, uh, when they go through the Federal Law Enforcement Academy to get commissioned. And uh, on top of that, they're, they're trained up. It takes about three years to, to fully train a ranger. Uh, and that's just in the basics. Um, so we, we did all that uh, between me and my partner, Stan. Uh, we were probably the prototype rangers of what they were aiming to train up, uh, being specialized in so many different areas. I mean, I was even trained in explosives and, and how, to, uh, how to handle kin sticks and dynamite and stuff like that. So um, we were trained in wildland firefighting uh, so that we could operate in the fire environments and not get burned up while we were there. So, uh, and having an understanding of fire behavior. So lots and lots of different stuff. Uh, I thought it was the coolest job in the world. And then on top of that, we were um, trained in police work. And because the Navajo Nation has very few, you know, they only have 250 police officers to cover 27,000 square miles of land and seven police districts. The Rangers at the time I was there, uh, they had uh, 15 Rangers doing the same thing. And we would be hiking down canyons, looking at archaeological sites, checking fishing licenses uh, down in the canyons, uh, say, toward Lee's Ferry, things like that. So uh, you're talking, you know, 700 to 900 vertical feet of hiking uh, up and down. Uh, so 
yeah, 27,000 square miles, just so you can get a, a feel for it, is about the size of the state of West Virginia. And, uh, you know, or, or you could say 17 million square acres of land. Um, it goes from desert and canyons all the way to a huge ponderosa pine forest, uh, pinyon juniper, uh, lots of deer, lots of uh, elk, um, a big, big uh, pine forest all the way through the reservation there. So you're doing this work, and how in the world did you get to the point where you get the assignment to investigate these paranormal cases? How did that come to be? Well, we had a couple of rangers get assigned to uh, a case up in the Carrizo Mountains. <clears throat> the uh, case involved a uh, elderly uh, couple that were up there. And once you understand elderly people that live out there, you understand that these guys, uh, they know all the different sounds. They know all the different animals. They've they've grown up there. They live up there. And um, they reported that they had a Bigfoot step over the corral. You know, it's, it's, it's a, a wooden log corral that they have, maybe about uh, five feet tall. This thing stepped over the corral, grabbed a sheep, tucked it under its arm, and stepped back over and walked off with it. So um, the two officers that were assigned were both rookies. And these guys had just been fresh out of the academy. Uh, if you knew them, uh, and you probably know officers like this, they're joking all the time, have their own little private jokes and laughing and, and you know, just have that little rapport amongst themselves. That's how these guys were. And they went up and they were doing the investigation. But as they were going along, they were giggling and laughing about their own little private jokes. Well, grandma and grandpa thought they were laughing about them. And uh, so, so, hang on a second. So they, um, excuse me. Uh, grandma came down and she chewed out our chief ranger. And I don't know if you've, you've ever heard the Navajo language, but, but to be chewed out in Navajo is, 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 there's no cuss words, but it's bad. And especially, you know, we really respect our, our elders out here. So uh, to be chewed out by an elder is even worse. And, uh, so he called everybody in uh, to a major department meeting. And so everybody came in and he said, from now on, you will investigate these cases seriously. I want reports on them. You, the, these will be investigated professionally. And then I like to tell people that he turned to me and Stan and uh, we were in an area called Special Projects. Special projects, we uh, had our own SWAT team. Uh, we were co-commanders. Um, we handled all the major cases. Um, we did all the dignitary protection. Um, you know, I mean, if Arnold Schwarzenegger came onto the reservation, we would be his personal bodyguards. Uh, Johnny Depp came out and Stan worked uh, with him, you know, doing uh, the Lone Ranger. So, um, we did that kind of stuff, and we had a lot of uh, investigations from other departments uh, where they would request our expertise in uh, in civil investigations. So we started doing, uh, I like to say we were voluntold. Uh, we, we just, uh, we didn't volunteer for it. We didn't raise our hands. They, they just... Uh, because we were the two most qualified. And the other thing we had going for us was that uh, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. Stan was uh, born in Fort Defiance, Arizona, but uh, as, an, as a child moved to uh, Tahlequah, Oklahoma, where his mother is from. And uh, he was raised in, in Oklahoma. So we didn't have the... Uh, the traditional upbringing and fear of paranormal things. 
that a lot of the uh, Navajos have. And so I think that's why we were chosen was that we uh, we would go right into these things and not not be afraid of them. Um, so we we started uh, doing those investigations based on that, and uh, we we were pretty interested in it. I mean, we looked at each other and we at the time X Files was really big, and we thought, oh my God, we're going to be the X Files, you know. Um, and we started having to purchase books and talk to people and get a hold of organizations and find out uh, how to uh, how to investigate these cases even better, so to speak. Well, you get your new assignment. What is the first case that you and Stan get? What, what's the first thing out of the gate that you guys go out and investigate? Uh, the first case occurred up in <clears throat> a place called Bloomfield, which is uh, outside of... Uh, uh, Farmington, New Mexico. And in that case, there were 30 separate people that reported Bigfoot, sightings of Bigfoot along the San Juan River there. Um, those cases were all taken, uh, a whole group of people went to the local police department there. The lieutenant came out to meet with them and he basically laughed at them and said, ha, 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 how much of these people had to drink? And he said that to a reporter. And the reporter recorded it in the newspaper. So the people were pretty upset. And they said, we want nothing to do with the police department anymore. So they called the Rangers. And uh, we sent a six-man detail up there uh, which is about a third of the department. And uh, we had forward-looking infrared systems. We had uh, PVS-14 night vision equipment for the, the crew. Uh, these were basically our SWAT team. Um, we, we were prepared. Uh, we spent three days and two nights at that location uh, with uh, nighttime stakeouts. And during that time, during the day, daylight hours, we went down the river and interviewed uh, as many of the people we could find that had made these reports and uh, spoke with them. And we got quite a few interesting stories, uh, one involving a kid that was, uh, he actually was told, they, they heard this thumping sound, the, the, the river valley, you know, it's, it goes up on both sides and the river cuts through the middle. And there's fields down there, you know, little fields, little little plots where they grow stuff. And this family had a garden down there that was fenced in. And uh, they heard this thumping and they thought it was a horse uh, down in the bottom in the field. So the parents said, hey, grab your BB gun and go run down there and chase those horses out of the field. Uh, the kid jumps down, goes racing down, you know, it's about, you know, a good 40 yards down the, the slope and falls on his butt at the end and he's looking up and a Bigfoot is standing over the top of him. And he says this thing was about seven or eight feet tall. It smelled like a really bad, uh, almost like a wet dog smell. And he said it just looked at him. He looked at it. He dropped his gun and scrambled on his, you know, backwards uh, on his hands and his feet, turned around and raced back up that slope. And, um, uh, you know, as near as he could tell, the thing just went over to the fence and stepped over. Uh, later on, he showed us where it stepped over the uh, five-strand barbed wire fence. And it had left uh, some hair uh, stuck in the barbed wire. So we collected that. It had some of the tag ends. Uh, we found uh, footprints uh, in the sand. Uh, they were indistinct, but the the um, the the distance, heel to heel, was uh, five feet. So uh, if I were to do a five foot stride for myself, I'd have to jump from foot to foot, or I would have to do the splits to make that distance and I can't do the splits. So maybe when I was younger, but not anymore. So 
we we did photographs and measurements. We found where this thing had taken a a huge huge log, uh, about twenty inches in diameter, that was waterlogged in a boggy area. Literally picked it up. It was half buried in the mud with with standing water on top, and picked this thing up and just tossed it to the side, uh, just like it was nothing. And we had a uh, Bigfoot investigator that came along with us, and he said that it was uh, Paul looking for grubs or something under the log to eat. Um, we we went back in the bush. We tracked all over the place. Uh, we sent the samples off to a lab. And you have to understand that these DNA labs, they have millions of DNA samples from all over the world. There's There's a whole... Uh, library of DNA that they compare can compare these to, and they came back with a document that said unknown carnivore. So um, that was our first case. We didn't actually see anything, uh, but there's plenty of evidence uh, that something did happen. One of the things that I've struggled with doing these shows, you know, I'm former law enforcement, so I had a certain approach. I'm a trained investigator. I'm a trained interrogator, and I did investigations in the field. So it's a fine line for me when I'm taking anecdotal accounts of what people have seen. That's all my show is really about is people sharing their experiences. So I have to be very careful not to interrogate the people because I want them to come on and feel comfortable telling the story. So how did you and Stan navigate that in the field as police officers investigating these things very seriously and walking that fine line between people being comfortable enough to share their experiences and not feel like you were interrogating them? Well, it, it is a fine line, and I'm sure we crossed it several times. Um, our aim with this stuff is we knew that there was a lot of people out there that were going to say, oh, poo-poo, you know, this, this, is, this is BS. You know, uh, uh, these things don't exist. So we set out to collect evidence, number one. Number two, we vetted uh, the people that we spoke to. Uh, we used a combination of questioning, of active listening, and uh, body language. Uh, you know, looking at the body language, you as an investigator know that there are what they call micro tells that'll uh, somebody will give away or they'll give a rehearse line or something else. So we went with this uh, way of doing things and we were rather harsh about the way we uh, vetted people. Uh, we would tell them straight up front, you know, we'd get all the basic information for the report, name, date of birth, you know, location, phone numbers. Um, after that, we would tell them, we're going to ask you some very, very embarrassing questions, and please excuse us, but we these are required uh, for, for our investigation because we felt that we needed to investigate it to the point where we could present a case in federal court with a 99.9% uh, uh, verified uh, that we could go to the prosecutor with. So what we did is we would ask them, do you use drugs? Do you use alcohol? And if so, how much? You know, when was the last time you used it? Uh, do you use prescription medication? When, when was the last time and what kind of prescriptions are you taking? Um, things like that. And, and then we would ask them, you know, the subjective, ancillary subjective, we'd ask them, uh, tell me your story. And they would give us a, a lengthy story and we'd be watching them during this time. And um, you start looking for rehearse lines. You start looking for the sand paku in the eyes. Uh, you know, all these tells that tell you that somebody is maybe making misleading statements or, um, you know, falsifying information. And once you're satisfied with that, you'll see if that fits in to what you've collected as evidence first. We always went and, and looked at the evidence uh, before we did anything else, and we let the evidence speak for itself. 
at the end of that, uh, then we'd write up our reports. And if we had questions, we would ask them, could you tell me again about this part? Could you tell me again about that part? Or, you know, the the the, the old kind of Columbo line, you know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm kind of wondering about this one thing. And, um, you know, and and you'd laugh with them and joke with them and, and keep them, you know, uh, juveniles. You'd have to uh, talk with them, uh, with their parents there and uh, make sure everything is above board. But, uh, you know, we had some really, really good interviews as a result of that. And they were at the time we recorded them on on micro cassette. And uh, I don't even know if those exist. They were put in the files and, you know, who knows where they went now. Uh, the department's moved a couple of times since then. Uh, we found out that a lot of our reports that were put in the system, they were locked down. So only uh, we and the chief ranger could access them. Uh, since then, the computer system was updated. Uh, we were using something called Cody. And um, that when they updated the computer system, we were so out of date that they told us that none of the information was going to be able to migrate. And, uh, you know, we had something like 14,000 uh, entries of just people information that we lost, uh, which which was uh, almost a disaster for us. Um, but, yeah, we, we did our jobs. We did that for a period of 11 years. And, um, you know, we, we just, every year we'd have anywhere from, 75 to you know a little over 100 uh, cases involving ufos involving uh bigfoot uh haunting cases and uh the uh, legendary navajo skinwalker uh cases which uh, we figured were the most dangerous cases you can investigate yeah i definitely want to get into the skinwalker stuff but before we do is there any other cases that you worked as far as Bigfoot that stuck out to you? And what was the general, I'm always curious about descriptions when people actually get to see these things, what they were describing as far as a physical description. So any other cases as far as Bigfoot that stuck out over those years? And what were people seeing and describing as far as the physical description of the creatures? The uh, physical descriptions were all over the place. We had uh, six foot examples. Uh, which we were thinking were juveniles. Uh, we had, you know, seven foot examples that were seen. Uh, we've heard of uh, red ones that, that had a, a different color, uh, almost like a stripe on them uh, that, that was white. Uh, we had, uh, and these were reported by government workers, by nurses, by professionals, you know, USDA workers. So, um, We've we've had, you know, brown ones, black ones, you know, just the whole range of colors. Uh, we had a little girl uh, or a couple of small girls that were chased by one after they got off at the bus stop and they had a quarter mile uh, walk back to the house. And uh, the brother came out heard, hearing him screaming and came out and saw the Bigfoot heading the other direction. Uh, we had one that actually... Uh, the, the one of the jails, I, I won't say which one, but they're all kind of built the same, were built back in the 60s, and they don't have very good ventilation. So imagine a long hallway and jail cells along the sides and a big drunk tank in there with bars and um, and then a back door. And because there's no air conditioning, uh, they would leave the back door open at night. And the jailers heard uh, the prisoners screaming bloody murder. And they, you know, got out their keys and went, opened the doors, went down there, down the long hallway. And they said all these uh, inmates, all the, in the drunk tank, were all piled into one corner and, you know, just screaming and hollering. And they said that uh, a big hairy thing came in that smelled really, really bad and looked at them through the bars and they started screaming and crowded into one corner. And they said the thing just stood up and turned and walked out the back door again. And, 
you know, I'd like to think in, you know, in, in my own mind that maybe some of these guys quit drinking, but, uh, you know, who knows? So, uh, yeah, lots of, lots of different cases. Well, I know one of the things that you were trained in was tracking and, I know you guys got out. I'm, I'm assuming you got to go on some of the fresher cases. Were there any occasions where you actually got to track one of these things or got close enough to to track them? Uh, there were actually numerous cases where reports were made <clears throat> where we uh, we did this as a matter of course of the investigation. Uh, you know, we were trained as combat trackers. And uh, so you're trained to look for people. You know, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to determine what these guys are doing, what they're thinking. Uh, are they taking the easy way? Are they going the, the hard routes? Um, you know, are they zigzagging? And which way is the overall zigzagging direction heading? Um, and you can actually start getting in their minds, you know, how often are they stopping to look back? How often are they stopping to, you know, to to defecate or pee? Um, you know, you can you can start. You look at the are they running? Are they walking backwards? Are they uh, trying to throw you off? Are they going over rocks? Um, sometimes, in order to pick up the track again, you're just looking for for pebbles pushed into the surface of the ground. And um, once you find it again, you know, you you do what they call casting. Uh, for us, I like to go in a spiral and keep working out until you find the tracks again. Um, I, my the longest I've ever tracked anybody was thirty miles, and I caught them. Um, so we we were on foot, and then the guy took off in a truck, and I actually tracked the truck and uh, tracked it into a border town and found it at a bar. So um, you know it works. Um, so we're very conscious about that. In combat tracking, uh, one guy tracks, the other guy is uh, on the side of you carrying a carbine or a rifle. And that way uh, you can track and not be worried about being ambushed. You may have to box around if there's an open area where an ambush could be set up, then you could uh, box around into the brush, come back up where the track should be on the other side and continue on. Um, so we would track Bigfoot. Uh, we tracked him literally for miles. And in two cases that we had that were, we thought were very significant, <clears throat> his tracks, we came to an area of what we call trackable ground, which is if he had taken another step, he would have left an impression. The tracks just vanish at that point, just like he got pulled up into into the sky. Um, we did the we started casting for the track again, see what happened. Uh, nothing after that. So now we're backtracking. We tracked it back to the location we first started, and then we backtracked to see where he came from. Again, we run into an area where his tracks start in trackable ground, but there's nothing around there after we look. Um, we started at that point to think that uh, there's a uh, some kind of a, a connection. Uh, we started seeing correlations that when Bigfoot cases were reported to us, to our dispatch, there was a corresponding increase in UFO cases that were being reported and vice versa. So we started thinking that maybe there's a connection between the UFOs and Bigfoot. Um, later on in, uh, in our research and, and, you know, as an investigator, you're not happy with doing a report. You're, you're wanting to know why. You know, you want to know the why of how this happened, why it happened, all the background, just like an accident. Uh, the point of possible perception, you know, all the way back uh, to to before the accident even occurred. So we started looking at that, and we started looking at the Bigfoot cases, at the UFO cases, at the haunting cases, and even the Skinwalker cases. And we came to the conclusion 
for ourselves that this had to do with uh, multi dimensions, that these things were disappearing into another dimension. And uh, I know it sounds pretty far fetched. We came up with this theory in 2009 uh, after investigating these things for a number of years, but it was the only thing that fit. Um, when you have uh, an object that apports, that comes into our existence on this plane in a haunting case. In our case, we had uh, uh, 65 coins that appeared over two nights um, that fell out of thin air. Sometimes they'd come flying out of the corners of the room, hit people, bounce, roll, spin, flip. And uh, over two nights, those 65 coins, which were pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters, all American change, all different years from, uh, what, 1917 pennies all the way up to, uh, you know, 2000, um, uh, you know, quarters. And uh, every one of them landed heads up which is a, a statistical impossibility. So, you know, and then Stan was, uh, I think he was overworked on that one because he called me and he says, what do I do? These coins are just appearing. And I says, well, you have to map them out in the room. You have to measure from two walls and uh, show exactly in the room where that quarter fell and, um, and then photograph it, bag it and tag it. He did that 65 times. So I think that probably took up the majority of his time. Well, he had three other investigators there to help him too. So um, we started to seeing things like that. And, and uh, uh, in speaking with people up in the Pacific Northwest with Indian tribes up there, we found out that some of them had actually witnessed Bigfoot uh, sitting behind a tree looking at them and watch them physically fade and disappear. So you mentioned it earlier, and I know this had to be a battle for you guys, at least in the beginning, you're establishing yourself as being somebody who's investigating these things. There's a taboo that goes along with any of these types of cases for just about anybody who's experienced it, but particularly for Native American and then the Navajo nation. So can you talk a little bit about the Native American and the, the Navajo specific oral traditions about Bigfoot and UFO and what I believe they call the star people? And what what is those oral traditions like as far as those things are concerned? How are those passed on? And how do people reconcile the Bigfoot and the UFO and the star people in, in the Navajo nation? Well, the the Navajo and Bigfoot go back uh, pretty much, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, they, they're, they're old, old stories that the medicine men tell. The most recent one that I've heard was in the late 1600s when the Navajos had acquired horses. And uh, they found a Bigfoot walking through an area. Uh, the warriors uh, used horsehair lariats that were, you know, basically horse tails that were braided together to make ropes. And they lassoed this thing. And they said that they were holding it between the horses and it sat down. And they said it spoke to them in their own language, which I thought was rather interesting because I've heard that uh, that Bigfoot can communicate, um, but it, it comes... Uh, into your mind, you can hear the words, uh, but it's not actually uh, vocally speaking to you. And uh, they're saying that it basically told them, you know, uh, if you will take me to the area around Mesa Verde, uh, I will not come back this way again. And so they rode with it between them uh, all the way up uh, probably about 100 miles to Mesa Verde, and uh, released it up there. Uh, so the Navajos say that if you sight a Bigfoot, 
do not look at it. They said that if you look at it in the eyes, it can take control of your mind, which is which is another idea for this idea of, of communication. Um, we think that it also operates uh, using infrasound, uh, kind of like an elephant. The sounds are so low and so deep that they don't even register uh, to us. Uh, if you think about humans, our our senses are so narrow. You know, on one side is uh, is a whole big band of infrared, and on the other side, there's a whole big band of X-ray. And we can't see either one of them. We just see in a, in a very limited visible range. Uh, so there's probably a lot of stuff that goes on that we are not aware of. Uh, the same with hearing. You're, you're talking to a guy that uh, I have to wear a hearing aid um, because of, of uh, they had a, a theory that uh, if you fired your weapon and you weren't used to the sound, that it would startle you. And so you need to practice without hearing protection. Uh, later on, it took a class action lawsuit to get the tribe to uh, offer for one year only uh, hearing aids to those of us that were affected from that. So I have uh, hearing loss and high frequency loss in my left ear. Uh, my family says that I'm uh, I'm, I'm well, with a selective hearing now, uh, that I only hear what I want to hear. But, uh, you know, I, I don't believe that. Just like snoring, you know, they, they tell they tell me I snore, and I told them, I, no, I don't. I stayed, stayed awake all night to see if I did, and I didn't. You know, so. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about some of the other cases that you guys covered. Bigfoot wasn't the only thing that people were encountering out there. Were there any of the UFO or maybe Elon? even some alien abduction or lost time sort of cases that stuck out to you over the years of your investigations? Well, um, you know, we had cases involving, uh, I had an orb that followed me for about, I would say 35 miles, um, two o'clock in the morning out in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, for those of you who may, want to have more detail from uh, around Indian Wells area in Arizona um, all the way to the state route 87 and route 15 junction um, about maybe five or eight miles past that. Uh, so it's about 30 miles uh, of, of time or, or length, you know, uh, this thing just, it was, it was green it was a big ball about the size of a basketball. It followed me until it veered off. And I watched this thing. I thought about turning around and uh, the law enforcement type A personality that I am, you know, let's go confront it because I got a gun. Uh, and then I thought, maybe that's not such a good idea. Uh, being that it's two in the morning and there's nobody else, no, no other vehicle was out there. So, you know, being thinking, thinking about it, I thought maybe uh, discretion is the better part of valor, and I will continue on my drive. It veered off and went up on the mesa tops and followed me from about a couple of miles away, uh, paralleled my course and turned red. And at that point, uh, that was the only time in my whole career I felt maybe a little uneasy. Um, we had a gentleman that actually saw uh, a UFO that landed uh, he saw the occupants on the ground around his house. Um, we interviewed him three different times over four years. His story never changed. So uh, culturally, Navajos are a, uh, they're, they're an oral tradition people. Uh, when you talk about oral tradition, uh, you're not talking about, oh, just tell the story correctly. You're saying that uh, in the case of a medicine man, an enemy way dance occurs over three nights at three different locations. You're going out to get medicine and you're bringing it back. And during that time, the medicine man will sing 
about 250 songs. And each one of these songs has to be done in the right order and the verses have to be correct. If they aren't, the whole, the whole ceremony is negated. So um, these guys, they train ever since they're very, very young children. And, um, and they have to get it right because there's a lot of people that are at these ceremonies that know how these ceremonies go. And they'll be, you know, just like us, they'll be the first ones to call you on the carpet and say, you didn't do that right. And you pay a lot of money for a ceremony. So if it's not done right, you know, you want your money back. And um, so, yeah, culturally, uh, Navajos have always coexisted with Bigfoot. Um, they've, they're told, just leave it alone. It, it exists. Don't look for it. Don't chase it down. Um, with haunting cases, uh, Navos are told, you know, you bury your dead within four days. If you don't, the spirit may decide it wants to stay here. Um, the, the whole idea is that you don't even speak the name of the person who's deceased. Because to speak their name is to be calling them back. And to create, create that ghost. Uh, to come back. So you don't do that. Uh, so there's a lot of things that go along with that. Um, so yeah, there's, you know, you, you don't really consider when you live out here and you're tuned in to the culture, uh, these are not superstitions. There's uh, a reasoning behind it. Um, it's not to say that, you know, we don't, we don't honor the dead. You know, I mean, Navajos traditionally are buried with tons of jewelry, um, you know, and metal detectorists, you know, have found out that if you're trying to metal detect on the reservation around here, somebody will start shooting at you. And, you know, they come to me as a ranger and say, somebody's shooting at me. And I says, uh, where were the bullets going? Oh, they were going way over our heads. And I says, they're just, I says, if they wanted to hit you, they would have hit you. Uh, but you're, there's a body buried in that hogan. And they don't want you digging around in there. You know, and besides that, metal detecting is not allowed on the reservation. So, you know, you're going to have to go somewhere else. I want to so, move into, I want to talk yeah, a little bit ahead. about I want to talk a little bit about the skinwalkers as well, but I have to ask this question because there's something that's come up. I live in North Carolina and there's a rich native American history out here in North Carolina. There's tons of mounds and there's been reports of little people. I've interviewed several people that have seen these little creatures. Did you guys ever have any instances where people were seeing not these giant hairy Bigfoot, but any of the little people? Did you have any cases uh, that involved those? Yeah, we had a case um, <clears throat> in the uh, southern part of the reservation where a lady saw uh, an extremely bright white light outside, uh, something that had landed out there. And she says these uh, these little people came out. They were they were like little green. Um, she she described them as almost something like uh, I'm trying to think of that movie with the. Uh, gremlins. She said that they were like little green gremlins that were running all over her kitchen. Her windows were open because it's summertime and it's hot and there's no electricity, so there's no air conditioning. And she says that these things were just running all over her kitchen and living room area and then all zipped out the window again and took off. Uh, we've had uh, reports of uh, Within the Hopi and the Navajo, they call the ant people that live underground. And the Hopi say that during the flood, the ant people allowed them to come into their their home and kept them there until the flood went away. Uh, the Navajos, in turn, say that they went to a place called Shiprock and got on top of the the, the peak of that thing and saved themselves. So again, universal flood that that's recorded in archaeology too. Um, I've had uh, 
reports of, of little things running around. One guy, uh, we had a case over in the New Mexico side of the reservation um, where there were a bunch of little things running all over the ground and a Bigfoot amongst them. And um, the guy, one of the uncles takes an AK-47 and starts shooting. And uh, before they all decide to lock themselves in their in their houses. And uh, afterwards, uh, state police showed up, Navajo police showed up, and uh, they said a, a, a government vehicle had government plates on the back, but it was a Cadillac Escalade, which to me doesn't fit because usually uh, government services administration vehicles are the low bid. And so they're not going to buy Escalades, you know, they're not going to buy Cadillacs. And they said this guy got up out wearing these battle dress fatigues, uh, armed to the teeth, you know, pistol, carbine, everything, um, all kinds of web gear, and walks up to the group of police officers who are doing what police officers do, you know, which is stand around, smoke cigarettes, and tell war stories. And uh, he chats with them and then goes back to his vehicle, opens the back. They said it lifts up, just push a button and it lifts. Um, gets an ice chest out and goes over into the field in this area that's, you know, open and puts the ice chest down and opens it up. And they said smoke came out of the ice chest. And it picked up something off the ground and put it in the ice chest, closed the lid, put it back in his, uh, in his black SUV and, uh, got in and drove off. So um, Stan went to investigate that case. Uh, we personally know a lot of those officers in that district. And when he went over there, none of those officers would talk to him, which is really unusual when you're on a name-to-name -name basis with somebody. And then the fire department had responded that night to this UFO case. Uh, the UFO was circling as these things were running all over the place. And um, they said that the, uh, the fire department was on the way. They saw this craft circling, this UFO. They turned the fire truck around and went back to the station. So the, he went to the fire department and asked them, and they wouldn't talk about it either. So apparently all of them were told, keep your mouth shut or else. Um, but we've never been able to verify anything else uh, other than uh, hear the stories from, from the people that were there that this happened. I w we can't close out the interview without talking about the Skinwalker. It's one of the things that has really fascinated me over the course of just about everything I've ever investigated, more so than anything. And I know that the, the Navajo Skinwalker is deeply ingrained into the culture and the fabric of the Navajo Nation. So can you talk a little bit about some of the cases where you guys, people had seen or dealt with the Skinwalkers and, and what happened during those cases? Yeah, we've had <clears throat> numerous cases, uh, even cases that were told, reported to me by police officers. Uh, one involved a uh, female prisoner that was arrested. Uh, she had been suspected of doing this stuff. She was in the back. Uh, they, they drive a uh, Chevy Tahoe, and the middle portion is a cage uh, with a seat. She was handcuffed behind her back. The uh, seatbelt was ratcheted, you know, back so that it wouldn't, if she leaned forward, it wouldn't go anywhere. Um, she was taken back to the station, no stops in between. And when they got to the station, the officer got out and the, the, the suspect was gone, disappeared. Um, that, that spooked them pretty bad. Uh, most officers will not talk about this subject. Uh, it's it's very very taboo. Uh, I am not. I, I guess I'm 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 the only expert that'll talk about it. Um, even medicine men, you know, unless it's in the course of their business, they won't talk about it. Uh, we had uh, one guy. His name is Haas Lore, that uh, was actually poisoned by one. 
he's an Anglo uh, school teacher at the time uh, up in the Pinyon area. And he saw this mangy dog, you know, I mean, patches of fur that were missing, just covered in dust, uh, uh, just skinny, looked like it was just going to fall over like malnutrition and, and just disease. And uh, it comes into his uh, in his driveway and he's working in the garage. So he grabs a two by four, goes over there and as hard as he can, whacks this thing in the head. And he says the dog fell down and urinated all over the place, which, you know, to him is, is the thing's dead. And uh, so he goes, of course, he goes in and tells the wife, you know, hey, look what I did. I killed his dog. And she said, show me. Uh, he went back outside with her and the dog was gone. So... Um, you know, he said that when he hit this thing, this cloud of dust came up. And uh, shortly after, he got sick. He got sicker and sicker and sicker. And in his own words, he says, I was crapping out one side and puking out the other and laying in a pool of sweat. Uh, he went to the doctors. The doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. And... Uh, you know, our joke out here is they'll, they'll give you a couple of Tylenol and tell you to come back and if it gets worse. So uh, he's just miserable and can't even hardly move. And his his wife, or I should say his ex-wife now, and his neighbor got him out of the bed, carried him to the truck, and drove him almost 100 miles to go see a medicine man. And... Um, he goes to the medicine man. They they take him in the Hogan. Uh, the son is with him, too. And the son stayed back, you know, when the medicine man invited him into the Hogan to do a ceremony. Uh, he says that the medicine man told him that if he had been another two hours or so, he would have been dead. Uh, they did a ceremony. They gave him something something bitter to drink. Um, he ended up vomiting, you know, still, and, uh, he says the next day he's feeling better. And after that, he recovered. He asked the son or the son was asked, how come you didn't come in? And the son says, because of that scary, dark man standing next to the medicine man that I didn't want to go, go in there. And he saw a figure of another man that was just a shadow standing there. And it scared him, so he didn't want to go in. Um, we had another uh, guy that uh, came out. And <clears throat> uh, for those of you who don't know what a sizzle reel is, it's usually about a 10, 15 minute uh, video where you're looking at possibly doing a documentary or a series. And uh, so, the producer came out with the cameraman and we're sitting out by a fireplace. It's, it's a built up stone wall that, uh, and we built a fire in there about maybe 25 feet from a Hogan. And uh, as we're sitting there telling war stories late in the evening, as the sun's going down, um, a coyote walked between us and the uh, Hogan stopped you know, as it's walking, and it turned and looked at us, turned again and walked, trotted off over the hill. Uh, there's nothing, the Hogan is sitting on this on this rise, and there's nothing all the way around, no bushes, nothing where it could hide. Me and Stan looked at each other, and we says, you know, oh, whatever. <laughs> you know, we, we took off after it. We went running after it. And we topped the rise. We looked all over the place. We couldn't see it. Uh, there was no, like I said, no place for it to go. We would have seen it. Um, shortly after that, the producer got sick. He stayed sick for a year and a half. Again, the doctors couldn't determine what was going on. How come he was sick? And uh, he finally did get better after a year and a half. But it took him that long to uh, to counteract whatever it was. Uh, we do know that the skinwalkers carry what they call corpse powder, 
which is, uh, you know, ground up human flesh um, and, you know, from a dead person and uh, other uh, botanical poisons that are included in it. And they're usually carried in a uh, piece of bone, uh, usually your, your radius or your ulna uh, that's, that's hollowed out, uh, yeah, dried up. And they pack it in there and they carry it with them. And when they get near you, they can just take that and blow it right in, into your face and uh, poison you that way. So uh, in this case, that's what we think was at work, that the dog had this powder all over its fur. And, and in the case of, uh, of this producer, you know, that, uh, that, that it was, he was poisoned in some way. I know, I believe Stan had his own experience earlier on before his days as a ranger. Would you mind sharing that story for the audience and telling them what he experienced? Yeah, he was at the theater in Window Rock. There's a little one, uh, one stage theater there. And uh, they, they show movies or they did for a long time. Then it went under and then it came back. It's still operating today. And uh, he got was asked for a ride uh, by an old man to go back to a place called Sawmill. Uh, it's 10 miles to Fort Defiance about another eight miles to Sawmill, and it's up on a hillside. So uh, on the Defiance Plateau. So Stan drives him over there because Stan's a nice guy. I mean, you know, he, he'd give you the shirt off his back if he thought you needed one. And um, he gives this guy a ride. The guy tells him, stop, stop right here. And it's out in the middle of nowhere, pitch black. It's, it's you know, getting late. Uh, there's no you know, street lights or anything, just pitch black. And the guy says, let me out here. And Stan asked him, you know, you sure you don't want me to take you up, you know, to, to a house or anything? No, 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 just let me out here. So he let him off, turns around and starts driving again. <clears throat> so he's doing about 50, 55 miles an hour. And out of the corner of his eye, he sees something running on the, out, you know, on on, on along the fence line and he says that it comes closer to him and it's keeping up with the car at 55 miles an hour and he's he's not wanting to look directly at it but he's looking you know kind of looking at it and he says what he sees is something that looks like a greyhound but it's white and this thing is really uh lean and muscular and the back comes up to the height of his window. So he says, it's big. And he says, it turns and looks at him. It, it turns to the side. And he says, the eyes are lit up kind of like a, an exit sign in a theater, that, that kind of a orange color. He says, the eyes are lit up and it looks like they're backlit from behind. And he says, it, it just had a mouthful of teeth. And he looked at that thing and he, he tells, it's really funny if you watch him tell a story because he'll physically, you know, he, he squirms down in his seat and he says he's just barely looking over the dashboard of the car and floors it and drives, you know, the, the five miles to Fort Defiance. He says he doesn't know how he made the T-intersection turn, but uh, obviously he, he did. Gets home. Uh, bails out of the car, runs into the house, and his dad's sitting there. He's all out of breath and panting, and he, his dad says, what the heck's the matter with you? And he described what he saw, and he says, oh, that's a skinwalker. You know, like, like uh, no big deal. You know, you, you saw one. So, uh, yeah. So, so there, we, there, you know, over the United States, there's something like 575 Indian tribes just in the United States, another 500 plus in Canada. And um, each one of those has some version of a shapeshifter. Uh, you have the Wendigo, you have the Rake, you have the, the uh, 
ones up in the Pacific Northwest, uh, everywhere we go, they talk about this. We're, we come to find out that uh, Africa has its versions of shape changers. Uh, Australia has its versions. Europe has its versions. Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, they all have some version of South America. So uh, it's, it seems like it's, it's not new. Uh, we think that they're uh, manipulating DNA to affect these changes uh, physiologically. Well, Jonathan, you've done all of these investigations. I don't really know where you were before you started these investigations. And after going through, I think you said 11 years of this, where were you going in on Bigfoot and some of this phenomena? And where are you? What's the final word for you after these investigations and all the phenomena that you've seen other people experience and the things that you've experienced yourself? How has that changed your opinion of all of these paranormal things over the years? Well, there's always been uh, a fascination with this stuff. I mean, I can remember reading Charles Blitz's book on, you know, uh, on weird things happening and, and the Philadelphia experiment. And, you know, uh, I always thought, wow, this is great fantasy. Um, but there was always an interest. And it wasn't until we started investigating these things that it started, you know, now I want answers. Um, and, and I'm not going to settle until I get answers that, that, uh, I'm happy with. Uh, like I said, back in 2009, we started talking about how all of these are, are connected through, uh, dimensional gates. And we started looking at the Navajo creation story that shows that, uh, the people, the Diné came up through different layers, uh, different worlds. And uh, they, they came from uh, a world of darkness through an aquatic world, through a world with giants and animals. Uh, and they saw a hole in the sky. So they put a couple of uh, things to climb on. Uh, they, they say reeds. It may not translate as that. We don't know. But they came up out of the ground in a place called Dineta, which is near the Four Corners into this world uh, that they call the shining world. And when I started rereading those and reevaluating in what we knew, you know, we started to understand that maybe they came through a dimensional gate or a portal into this world. And uh, a lot of other Indian tribes have very similar stories that, that they came from somewhere else to this world. Uh, the, uh, the Navajos have long said that star people have come to visit them. Uh, what I find amazing is that when you talk to uh, elderly people, and I'm talking 80 years old out here, that grew up out here, they don't speak English. They'll tell you, they'll, they'll tell you all these stars up here in the sky. Um, they'll name them in Navajo. And they'll name constellations. And they'll name constellations that, that we can't see with the naked eye. You'd have to have a telescope to see these. So, um, you know, there it's, I just find that amazing. And I, I'll have to say this, if you watch the series Skinwalker Ranch, every time in the early episodes they showed, they talked about skinwalkers, they showed a, a picture of this guy wearing a black mask with little white eyes and stuff. That's a, um, it's, it's a dancer, uh, in, in, in Navajo. And, um, he's depicting a God, one of the star people. And, uh, so he's not a skinwalker. Uh, skinwalkers can come all, they're, they're different. They're, they, it just depends on the personality of the skinwalker. Some of them are painted white all the way down, even their hair and the paint cracks. Uh, we've heard of some that are half kangaroo and half uh, human. Um, somewhere along the line, we think they got a hold of a kangaroo skin. Uh, they come in the form of dogs, uh, coyotes, wolves, birds like owls, ravens, you know, things like that. Um, so, 
yeah, there's there's a long history. Navajos won't talk about them. Uh, do not ever go to anybody that says they're Navajo and start asking them about skinwalkers. Uh, it's they they'll look at you, turn around, walk the other way, because to talk about them is to invite them to come come to you. They know when you talk about them. In fact, after I get done here, uh, I'll be just doing my prayers and smoking myself, uh, you know, with sage to to protect myself just for talking about it. Well, Jonathan, I really appreciate it. It has been absolutely fascinating stuff. I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and sharing the stories and sharing your experience. And thank you so much for your service to the community all those years and everything you did for the people that you you helped on those investigations. It's it's truly an honor and a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, and uh, both me and Stan will be at the uh, uh, Contact in the Desert and we'll both be at the Roswell incident coming up. I will be at the Boreal Bigfoot Conference in Fairbanks, Alaska, coming up at the end of June. And uh, if you would like to see the Netflix episode, it's uh, season three, episode five, called Paranormal Rangers. I will link to that in the show notes. You guys go over and check it out. Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me on.